Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in again. I am Kaylee Bateman, the content director at She Can Code, and today we are discussing why a non-linear career isn't a bad thing. We're delving into the idea that a non-linear career journey isn't something to be feared, but rather embraced and celebrated. Luckily, I've got the fabulous Jane Lockwood, COO at Demon, with me today to share our own personal antidotes and insights revealing how she navigated a non-linear career path. Welcome, Jane. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you very much, Keely. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for, for taking the time out of your busy day to, to come in um, and have a chat with us My uh, on Spilling the Tea. Can we start with a bit of context, a bit of background about yourself, please, and how you got into tech and a bit about your career journey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am quite literally the uh, the bastion of a non-linear career, I think you can you can successfully say. So I will uh, I'll sort of talk you through it. I I uh, went to university and I actually studied food science and nutrition. Um, oh, wow. OK. You're yes, the first that... I've heard say that on here. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> it was something that really interested me. And you know, when you study a degree, like, a lot of people think, oh, it's just nutrition. It's, you know, there's not much to it. It wasn't. You know, we we studied things like uh, the impact of cooking on a muscle fibre uh you know that what happens when you actually ingest vitamin c you know it was vast in terms of what we covered so it was a lot of chemistry it was a you know it was very much a science degree rather than anything else yeah. um and i was very fortunate to have a placement year whilst i was doing that uh, degree uh, at geese prepared foods and i spent six months in their salad factory and i spent six months in their pizza factory and as part of the uh, work experience, I was given two months in each area. So I did accounts, I did buying, I did procurement, I did technical, I did um, uh, yeah, the manufacturing, you name it, I did it. It was an absolutely brilliant piece of um, work experience that I got within my degree. And it was so interesting being a supplier to all the big retailers. You know, we were dealing with all, all of the big names that you can think of. And sitting in various meetings and seeing how they work and seeing how we work. It was just a brilliant. I was very fortunate to have had such a good career and such a good placement year. So sort of doing my last year, I was thinking about, you know, what is it that I want to do now? And even at that stage, you know, I, I know I wanted to study food. I was interested in it, but I didn't really know where I was going to end up at the end of my degree. And having gone through such a great experience, I thought, OK, of those six areas that I tried within that within Geest, which was the one that really interested me. And I was like, actually, do you know what? I actually really enjoyed the buying side of it, which bearing in mind, I was a science and a bit technical. It's like, well, that could be, that could give me an interesting point being a buyer and having a technical background. It's not often that you get those two together. So that was sort of the decision number one. Decision number two was then, okay, I really enjoyed being a supplier, but I've also probably want to see what it's like to be on the, on the, on the end of the line. I want to see what it's like to be the retailer. I want to see what it's like to be the client. So um, looking at all the all the big retailers out there, I thought, you know what, it, it, what, what, what where, where, where does it align? Where, what, what, what was my natural affinity? And having been a child that had been brought up on Percy Pigs and Colin the Caterpillar, I thought, you know what, if I'm going to work for a food retailer, I want to go to a Marks and Spencer's. So <laughs> I don't I, it was the only job that I applied for. I was so confident in my youth that that was the role I was going to get that I went for it. And fortunately, after an assessment centre and a number of interviews, I actually got the role. So that's how I ended up as a retailer to start with. I was, again, very fortunate that, that my time at MS was brilliant. I was really lucky. I started off in confectionery. So I actually did spend some time buying Percy Pigs, uh, which was so brilliant. And then I moved on to boxes of chocolates and all of that kind of thing. So I was very lucky. It's a great way to start your career. See, I heard a rumour, we had a developer from m &S that was on um, one of our webinars and um, she was on one of our podcasts and she told me that Percy Pig turns up at the Christmas party. Is that true? Did you see that? Do you know what? It was too many years ago for me to, to, to be aware of. You know, when I first started, I think Percy Pigs had only been around a couple of years and you know, it, to see what, what Percy and Penny and all of the rest of them are like now, it's just I, every time I walk into the shop, my little my heart does a little flutter. Yeah. Looking at them, I'm very emotionally att attached to those little pink pigs. Well, <laughs> uh, and they know that apparently now they, they do turn up at the Christmas party um, to, at the joy of all of the employees. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very jealous that, that I haven't got to meet him in person yet. Maybe one day that should be my my aspiration. <laughs> Amazing. Like, uh, somehow you made it you you crossed over into the tech industry I mean you said you know you'd, you'd studied in STEM so you, you must have had um you know some kind of flair there that you thought you know this is definitely where I would like to stay in STEM subjects 
and then you, you move from Percy Pigs into the tech industry. What what happened there? Well, there was a quite a big gap in between that. Um, whilst whilst I was at Marks and Spencers, I was fortunate enough to then meet what what turned out to be my my husband. Um, so I did seven years at m and in various areas. You had Percy Pigs, I did fish, I did flowers and plants, you name it. I was working in each of those areas. But um, we got to the situation where you know, the wedding bills came along, the, the first pregnancy came along and and, and I had, we had our, our son, William. Um, and I was all ready to go back to, to having a career. Um, but I think both of us then sat down at, 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 you know, and had a very big conversation about A, did we want somebody else to bring up our children? And B, how do I how do I support him in terms of what his career aspirations were as well? Um, we were he was in a position then where he was spending a lot of time traveling internationally. He was going over to India. Funny enough, he was in IT at the time then. Um, so we came to the very big sort of we had very big honest heart to heart and made the decision that actually I would stay at home, and that would allow him then to do his career. It was great for him. It was great for the kids, and at the time, it just felt really right for me. And we not I would say weirdly it's quite uniquely I did that for 10 years I took 10 years out so it wasn't a short gap it was a very much a long-term gap um and obviously a very different way to what I thought I would what I would be doing in my career at that stage um and then interestingly when my boy started school um he started school with another little lad who um he was friendly with and his parents now his his father is actually my boss at Demon. So our kids have grown up together. They've done lots of events. They play football matches together and cricket and rugby and all of that kind of thing. And uh, Steve, one of our founders, had had said to me at numerous times, do you think you ever gone back to work? And I was like, you know what? Who knows? I'll keep my eyes open. I keep my ears open. If something arrives, it arrives. And then in 2015, he gave me a call and said, look, Jane, we've, we've just had this big recruitment campaign. We've got 250 CVs in. Any chance you could pop in for a couple of weeks and just help us out? And I was like, yeah, absolutely fine. I'm still here. I've never left. <laughs> I just popped in. <laughs> I did pop in for a fortnight, but eight and a half years later, I'm still here. <laughs> so as I said, that's it's, a, quite that's a good a unique, story. <laughs> it's quite a unique, and it's very, very much a non-linear career path. So that's kind of how I've got there. And obviously my time within Demon has been, you know, I was employee number six. I was very much brought in as what I call myself, you know, Girl Friday, to sort out that filing cabinet that was building up in the corner to put some process in place to sort of you know write some contracts to buy merchandise you name it I did a little bit of everything and slowly over the last eight years or, or probably quite rapidly now you're bearing in mind we're sort of 150 odd as the company has grown each of those roles have got bigger as they've got so big somebody else then has come in and taken those roles and by virtue I find myself at the COO role with all the roles I used to do before now other people looking after them. Oh, I see. And it's always so interesting to hear. Um, we hear it often on this on this podcast and, and from ladies on, on our live events as well about companies, uh, people that have returned to work after a break and the companies that grab hold of those employees, mm. because that little bit of just, you know, training to, to, to get somebody back into the workplace or train them up on whatever it is that they need them to do and that job they need them to do. Then those employees, I mean, you just said, you know, you popped in for two weeks and you stayed for eight years. Those employees are very loyal yes. in the sense that, you know, they've been given a chance, they've been, you know, um, given the opportunity to uh, have some training to get you back into the to the workforce. And then you stick around yeah. uh, because of that. So yeah. it's um, very much kind of, you know, you was given that opportunity, you realised it was a great employer um, and you, you stayed put for far longer than two weeks. <laughs> I think I'm also also I, I would say this is sort of still how demon is um it was very much a case of and it's quite refreshing I would say probably even eight years on but my, my initial conversation with them when we were talking about me working for them on a more permanent basis was I I have two children at that stage I had a you know another one and my husband's not around very much if I need to go I'm going to go if I want to go to a football match I'm going to go and they were and they were just so open-minded about it and just said absolutely why are we even having this conversation you know if we contract you for 20 hours a week we don't mind if you do it at nine o'clock at night or nine o'clock at the morning do what yeah. you need to we're not going to set any expectations live your life do what you need to do with your children and your family and come to work and 
it was very refreshing at the time. It was it was absolutely brilliant for me. It was the 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 alignment of that happening at that time and my children being that little bit older. It was absolutely yeah. brilliant. And I think it's that you like you say the loyalty that I have to them that allowed me to do that. And yeah. I still do it now. You know, and everybody in Demon does that. It's a really lovely way of working. Where... And a lot of companies say you can do it but absolutely when you attempt to go and do exactly something. that. Like, exactly. where are you why aren't you chained to your desk <laughs> exactly that well you know and I speak to my colleagues now they say oh sorry I can't I'm not I'm out walking the dog at the moment I'll give you a call in half an hour no problem yeah and today we're going to talk a little bit about linear and non-linear career paths can we start with what is the difference between a linear and non-linear career path okay so I think I, I, so obviously thinking about this in, in, in advance of our conversation I, I, I my sort of definition of a of a linear career path would be probably more of a traditional career path um, where you progress through a series of jobs in a specific field. You know, typically as you as you progress, you get increased responsibility, you get more pay. If you look at something like accountancy, for example, you will um, you'll start out at an entry level accountant. You'll work your way up to a senior accountant, a manager, and then eventually even probably a partner or something at a firm. So that is what you know we would class traditionally as a, a, yeah, as a traditional career path. A non-linear career path um, is obviously much more flexible and probably a lot more unpredictable. Um, it's not, you know, in five years, you're not necessarily going to be here or in 10 years going to be here. It's what you want it to be in five years or what you want it to be in 10 years. It's going to involve changing jobs. It can involve changing industries, and it, even careers altogether. It can be something yeah. completely different. And I think this type of path, this career path is becoming more common on the job market. Um, it's just more reflective of the way that we live our lives now the world is more dynamic people want more meaning they want more fulfillment from their work and that's not always going to be in the same career in the same path and the same way of doing it and you know I, I, we talk about my experience quite a lot in the, in the over the next couple of questions but but for me I never would have got the opportunities that I have if I just stuck in stuck in in one field yes exactly that and I think you are right it's, it is becoming more common as well because I think employers it's dawning on them that people the priorities change and throughout your life and throughout your career and like you said you know you got married you had children and your priorities changed and what you wanted to do changed you don't always know fresh out of university what you want to do the career path that you want to take and and sometimes I think having had conversations with um, graduates they feel that if they haven't picked that career path and they don't know what they want to do, it's almost like they're failing before mm -hmm. they've even left university. Like you're meant to know exactly what that path is, is going to look like. Um, and I wish, it, even going back to my younger self, as, it, as if you could say, you know, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter, you can try different things and people are not going to frown upon you moving around and trying new things and that good employers just grab hold of good talent mm -hmm. and that all of those lots of different skills can come from lots of different um, career transitions and um, even taking a career break and the things that you learn when when you become a parent and all of those new skills that happen Absolutely. are just things that you wouldn't have known previously. So, yeah. you know, it's kind of why why do people think you have to leave uni and have it all mapped out? It's just such a mis misconception. It is. It is completely. I think I think it's, um, you know, and we do we, we put ourselves under too much pressure I think you know we, we're all guilty of doing that and especially when you're younger and you're that unsure and I think almost you know to a certain extent almost a stigma associated with the fact well you do, what do you mean you don't know what you're doing you, you don't know what to do for a career path it's and it, and it I think it's getting better I think it is improving but I think those you know the sort of um the, the early years are so much more important than just what you're going to do for the next 40 years yeah and two examples that I think were are sort of really relevant to this is if you look at um, the amount of people that go to university and get a degree or further education, the proportion of those people that then go on to study that or, or have a career path in that chosen subject is really very small nowadays. It's more yeah. about being a part to be able to apply yourself for three or four years and learn a topic that then opens your door, the doors to so many other opportunities that you didn't even think about when you were 18. The fact you've managed to apply yourself, got yourself a really good qualification, that opens doors that you just don't expect. And something like um, I was reading around uh, the top 10, my, 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 my second son has just done his GCSEs. My first son is, is at the second year of university. So whole higher education, further education. There's a lot of buzzwords around our house at the moment. And we were looking at top 10 degrees. And, and interestingly, the number one 
uh, subscribed degree in the UK of psychology which I was fascinated about. That's like, that's very, very interesting. But then if you look at the number of people that then go on to do a psychology based career, the fraction of the people that do that degree is tiny. But yeah. all of those people you will find will probably be absolutely fine getting a role, but it won't necessarily be in the straight psychology field. So I thought that was really interesting. The other thing as well, which I think is really important for not even necessarily younger people just you know I, I i i must say i teach it to my kids or something I, I hold very dear to my to myself is all those soft skills that you will be learning in parallel when you're taking on any qualification whether it be a technical qualification or not and i'm not talking necessarily about presentation skills or managing upwards you know those ones that you would talk about in the corporate world this is more things like pragmatism self-awareness empathy motivation those kind of things also known as emotional intelligence and i think Emotional sense for me is probably the most fundamental skill that you can you can develop and you should be developing it from one like from day one. I think it's probably the most important life skill you can have. Um, it's just something yes. that, that resonates with me very strongly. Yes, definitely. And I think all of those as well, you start to pick up from university. Like you said, sometimes the skills you pick up, even when you're studying, even if you don't know what you want to do. And I had lots of friends at uni who use their whole uni experience not really knowing what they wanted to do even when they graduated sure. but you pick up a lot of skills along the way all those soft skills I remember my parents said to me when I came back from university I was a different person and it was only because I had lived away for three years and I felt mm -hmm. like I really come out of my shell because I was allowed to live away and be my own person and it was just it, I, I've always said even you know the qualification it's worth it but actually the experience of who you become when yeah. you're at university is so, so worth it. Not necessarily the job that you might go into when you do graduate. And that is really difficult as well, because um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, we're, we're told from a young age that we have to know what we want to do. Um, <laughs> you know, we've spoken about that. Some people don't even know when they leave uni, but what do you do if you truly don't know what you want to do? Where, well, you know, what, what do you do? Well, I would say first and foremost, you would kind of ask your question about what what excites you, what you know, what gives you a buzz. What's that? You know, you if you're somebody that fundamentally doesn't like English, you're not going to do a, a degree in English, are you? Yeah, it's no. simple things like that. If you were <laughs> if you're science led, do a science based degree. Don't worry about the future. Just what is that thing? And I would always say that make sure it's something that you're engaged with, you're motivated with. It feels like a good opportunity for you rather than necessarily a tick box exercise that says I probably should go into this field or I probably should go into that field. So that yeah. would kind of be my my number one thing. And I think, you know, it's interesting that, 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 that we talk about what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do, especially at a young age. Again, coming back to my son, who's 19, I had a really interesting conversation with him over the weekend and just said to him about when he comes out of university and he's looking further afield into future careers, what is it that he's looking at? And we kind of had this quite good conversation over the dinner table the other night. And we we kind of summarised three really interesting points. My parents and probably their parents were from a generation where it was normal for the man to go out to work. My generation, so obviously I'm obviously a lot younger than my parents and my grandparents, my generation is very much geared towards all of us working, but in theory, creating this work-life balance. Yeah. Now, interestingly, his generation is much more focused on enjoyment, personal fulfillment, healthy lifestyle. So what you could say is theirs is a life-work balance, whereas my generation is a work-life balance, theirs is a life-work balance, which was really interesting when we looked at it and thought, they're looking for something different yeah. and it's always evolving and it's absolutely right and so should it be. We all spend so much time at work. We have to find that thing that ticks all those boxes for us in all the right places. Yes, definitely. I, I couldn't agree more. And And you are right things are changing through generations. And I think employers are starting to catch on as to okay. what people want, what the, their candidates are looking for and how to draw in um, good talent. Because I, I wanted to ask you about how do we, uh, should we be moving away from this narrative of kind of, you should know what you want to do. And if you haven't got it or you haven't got 10 years of work experience, by the time you go and apply for a job, it's almost like a company is going to look at you and, and, and think, well, you're, I, I love the word, uh, the phrase uh, squiggly careers yeah. um, that keeps coming up. <laughs> and if it looks like you've had that squiggly career, it doesn't always look like, oh, you know, perhaps an employer will think, well, she, you know, she wasn't committed in that area or, yeah. you know, and we really need to move away from that narrative, don't we, that you have to have it all figured out and you have to have yeah. a very clear career path. Completely. I mean, I think 
non-linear career paths becoming the new norm yes i would really hope that that is is where we're going to get to from a personal point of view i feel i've gained more experience in my working life i've got better personal development obviously as a result of that i've got better skill set probably than if i'd stuck on a traditional trajectory in terms of a career i think interesting you know it would be it would be naive of us not to bring the pandemic into it i think the situation that we found ourselves i think that's had quite a lot of uh, impact on people um, and how they're looking at their their longer term careers. You know, we all know people that have moved completely away from from the industry that they were in prior post the pandemic, and just you know have, having had time to think about these things and look at what they're doing and thinking, is this really what I want to do? No, and it was a really good opportunity for a lot of people to just sort of reset and say, I can look at doing other things. I can look at other things. I can look at other qualifications. So I think that was really good, and I, and I think as well, obviously. As much about the um, the career path that you follow, I think it's also really important to find that company that's right for you. Everybody's got different aspirations in terms of what they want out of their career, but I think finding the right company for you in terms of what they what, what's important to you is really important. You, you you know nowadays it's not just about what was the old days; it was all about salary. It's not about that anymore. It's about career opportunities. It's about culture. It's about well being. It's so much more than it ever used to be, and. It's quite interesting bringing it back to Demon again. When when people join Demon, they go through three interviews. They have a technical interview. So, you know, what, what's the role in, in Compass and, and, and is that their sweet spot? We have a second interview then, which is a culture interview where they'll come in and talk to members of the culture team, mm-hmm. understand what Demon's all about. We understand what they're all about. Is there a natural synergy? Are we on their wavelength? Do we get what was important to them? Yes or no? And then finally, everybody then will also talk to the founders because at the end of the business, the, you know, the, at the end of the day, the business is set up by the founders and it's very much their ethos, their ideas. And if they can sit and have a chat with the, the founders and say, yeah, I get it. They've come through those three stages and said, yeah, you know, Demon reflects what's important to me as an individual. They turn up on day one and half of the sort of, you know, the, the, the scaredness of, oh, my goodness, what this is going to be like. They've experienced a lot of it along, the, on, along through the interview process. So I think really, you know, coming back to that initial point, that's just what we do in Demon. But finding that company that suits you not just about your your career, but all the other stuff that goes with it is really, really important nowadays and a good thing. It's a good thing that we're putting a, a lens on this now where we haven't historically. Yes, I, lo- I, I love everything you just said there um, about <laughs> your, your interview process and just acknowledging as well that people want to know that. People want to know in, in depth about your culture. They don't want to be thrown into a job and then they realise actually this wasn't for me. And it mm-hmm. does work both ways you know, employers trying to figure out, are you the best candidate for us and our culture um, and vice versa? Mm -hmm. Um, There was a a report from um, uh, Deloitte that I've mentioned on on here before. And it was uh, uh, around, there was a point in there around young people that previously young people, younger generations used to look at things, as you said, like salary, that was important. Mm -hmm. And they found that nowadays, young people are actually more interested in diversity Yes. and culture and th- and they're asking about those things in the interview process mm. because they don't want to work in companies where you know they get thrown in and they think this was nothing like what I thought it was going to be like mm. they really want to make sure um that they're joining somewhere as you said that gets them as well you know just a company that gets you and understands you and that sense of belonging um is so important to, mm. to people nowadays and you know if, if a company doesn't get you or you have that feeling of perhaps this isn't for me more people nowadays they're just they're just leaving you know you can't retain good talent if you're yeah. not flexible in that way um or if you you know really um don't try hard to obviously retain your uh, employees mm. um and some of that as well uh it can um, come uh, around a oh, there's noise um, we'll cut that out sorry um, <laughs> um I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, you took a career break uh, to have children. I did. Um, how did you prepare for coming back to work? I know you said, you know, you you thought you were going in for two weeks and you ended up the same for eight years. Uh, <laughs> did you do anything in, in between that when you were coming back to kind of prepare for coming back to the workplace? Well, I think after 10 years away from the workplace, raising children, your negotiating skills improve no end. So uh, <laughs> that was the first thing that I sort of concentrated on and probably honed, honed in quite well in over 10 years. Because we all know that if you've got small people, but, you know, they, they do take it. They do take some negotiations sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but in all seriously, I, I, you know, I didn't actively look for roles uh, in preparation for coming back to work, but I did make sure that I kept myself still involved. 
little things, lots of little things. Um, I volunteered at my kids' school, um, helping them to grow vegetables. Um, I volunteered again at my kids' school, helping to put on the, the annual play and, you know, coordinating the costumes and doing the design and little things like that, which just kept me active. The other thing as well, or, or the other thing that I really enjoy doing is, is working in, in voluntary um, organisations within my local community. Uh, we would do gardening and things like that for disabled people, older people that couldn't cope. And you're turning up there on a Wednesday morning in the truck with all your mud and, and every, you know, the, their faces when you walked out the door was just such a lovely thing to do. But it was as much as you know, making sure I'm still planning everything and I'm coordinating things and I'm training others. And you know, there's all the organisation of making sure everybody's in the right place with the right equipment at the right yeah. time. So it, it, it might seem like a tenuous link, but it, it's still lots of soft to, skills. Yeah. Again, lots and lots of soft skills. And just keeping your mind active, keeping it motivated, keeping it in the workplace, just keeping it, you know, afresh of, of, of not just being, not becoming stale. And, you know, I, and I say that you're just not supposed to be derogatory to, to some to people that stay at home and look after children, but you've got to keep your eyes open. You've got to keep aware of what's going on. For me, that worked really well. My personal fulfillment as well. I absolutely love doing things like that. So it was brilliant. And as I say, it kept all those soft skills going again as well. Yes, definitely. And We've spoken on here a little bit um, already about uh, non-linear career paths. Um, and I, I want you to ask you a little bit about are, are there benefits to a non-linear career path? It's I suppose it's normally seen as a negative, like mm. as in, you know, an employer might look and we've spoken a little bit about that. And I kind of question, what on earth was she doing? Why does her yeah, career path look absolutely. like that? Yeah. And I suppose if you're transparent about your career path, um, and why you went in lots of different directions and picked up lots of skills with you along the way. I suppose there are lots of benefits to that, isn't there? A one hundred percent. I I I couldn't agree more. I think you know. I, I, although I before I answer this question, I think I probably just put a caveat in. You know, there are lots of people that want train, chase, choose a vocation, such as doctors and accountants and 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 you know all those kind of careers. I've got the utmost respect for those people, and you know, by virtue of the fact theirs will always be in a linear career. And I and I'm as I say kudos to them that they they follow a career through and, and, and do it for years and years on end absolutely brilliant so I'm not saying anything you know contradictory to to, to what they do from a, from a traditional point of view but for me personally my um I would say my non-linear career has allowed me to be exposed to so many more interesting situations and scenarios from that I've developed so or I've, I've, I've experienced so much more personal learning and personal growth um would have I got exposure if I'd stayed in one career Probably not. I'd probably say I wouldn't to, to compared to what I have. With my view and perspective into science, retail and now IT, I feel I could change jobs, industries or careers altogether um, with, yeah. with the skill set that I've developed over the years. And, and I think if my CV sat on front in somebody's desk, they'd say, that's interesting. How come she's been all over the place like this? And it actually it would create a conversation piece. Yes, so from my point of view, because yeah. people come Absolutely. in from all different routes. And that's, that's the great thing about the industry. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I completely believe there are benefits to a nonlinear career. It allows people to develop their personalized career path as well. That's the other thing. Yeah. At different stages, you want different things that, you, you know, your personal fulfillment is therefore better. You can use the skills and talents, the, the, the talents that you develop along the way to you make a difference and and actually work on stuff that you feel passionate about, which I think is really important. If you want to get up to go to work every day, that is 90 percent of the battle. Yes. Yes, and I, I I love that. I lo I, I definitely agree that there are benefits to um, non-linear career paths. I do think sometimes employers, or not even an employer, you know, a, say it's a recruiter looking at your CV and they might mm. think that's a red flag. But if somebody really knows you um, or has met you, then that you know they can see all the benefits that have come with it. And and I am wondering, do you think employers favour linear careers over non-linear careers because? Even though we might assume that it's seen as a negative moving around, actually, a lot of employers probably think that is a very well-rounded person that comes with lots and lots of different skills. Yeah. You know, surely that's employers must see it that way as well. well I, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, you know, there, there's always arguments for both sides. But as we've talked about, you know, every employer and every em employee is different uh, and there will always be a requirement for a traditional career path. I completely, completely agree with that. Overall, I do believe, though, that employer pre preferences have actually shifted. I think they are shifting from the linear path to, to more diverse hiring. 
personally, if I've got three CVs that are on my desk and there's a similar skill set, I will choose the candidate that's got the more diverse background to the one that doesn't. The, you know, the additional life experience is invaluable when it comes to decision making or problem making, for uh, problem, problem solving, for example. Um, and those candidates with career breaks as well. You know, there was always that we talked about before when you've got a big gap in your career. It was automatic. Well, we'll put that CV in the bin. Not anymore. It's just a different world now. You know, the fact that I chose to took 10 years off to raise my children. I don't think that's penalised me. Um, I really don't think it has. I've just got on done what I've need to do I can perfectly explain why there's nothing on my CV for 10 years so why should that be a derogatory gap in my CV it's not it's just just my life took a different path at that time so you know I from my personal point of view as I say the more diverse the CV uh, personally that that's more interesting to me that makes me look further and go that's really exciting that's what that's what I want to do I think we uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention is at Veeam and we were very fortunate um last year to work with a company called Tech Returners um, yes. and we I love Tech program. Returners yeah. aren't they brilliant so we started yeah. one of their programs that um that, that bring people into the tech center uh tech tech sector should I say these people are either returning to the to, to a career break or, or having a career change and we brought on a number of people from this scheme and what they have brought to Demon as a completely different way of looking at their career path and them as individuals, it's been brilliant. Their diversity of thinking, they brought such a refreshing change and actually they've challenged us in a number of different ways. So, but why do you do it like this? Why do we look at this? Why can't we look at this as an opportunity? So that's been hugely fulfilling for us and them. And it's a great opportunity where you know, that's a whole group of people that are coming to a new industry or coming to a new opportunity and with it bringing lots of stuff for us as the employer as well. Yes, and things as well that you might not have even thought of because Absolutely. they come with complete diversity of thoughts mm. and skills that you didn't even probably know that you were aware that you needed um, in, in your workforce. And and we've spoken a little bit about non-traditional routes um, and, and soft skills today. Um, and I, I wanted to just touch upon that a little bit more um, and how non-traditional routes into tech can can help your soft skills because um, I had a, a, a lady on here previously who she was a returner to tech she had taken a break um, for children and she said when she transitioned into tech uh, she said it, it it took me a little while as it just kind of dawned on me that even though I felt very junior because it was my first role I'd actually been in work 15 plus years at that point <laughs> It's easy to think that. <laughs> it dawns on you, actually, yeah. taking a non-linear route. You know, you've been in work. You've got all of these wonderful soft skills. And just reminding, just almost taking a step back and thinking, actually, I'm not junior. I, yeah. I'm at an advantage. Surely, mm. you know, that that has so many um, benefits. Absolutely. Absolutely. And actually, what I will do, you know, in answer to your question is I'd like to cite two of the people that we've got at Demon um, as a really good examples of two people that have changed their careers. So, um First of all, I'll talk about Naomi. Um, Naomi joined us earlier in the year. Um, she's previously worked in UX and UI and an interior designer. Um, having joined Demon, you know, having, having, as I say, historically having worked in a sort of a creative and a design-based field, that's pretty different to what we do at Demon. So she's brought something completely different to us all and made us all sit up and look and just say, that's a really interesting, interesting way of looking at things differently to what we did before. And what's interesting, she she heads up our um, social working party. So as well as uh, you know all, all the awesome stuff she can do from a career point of view, she also brings a different way of looking at things. She's stepping outside of her comfort zone, stepping into a role like that where you're responsible. You're not responsible, but you're looking after all the social aspects of the business. She's only very junior, but because she's used to changing she's made a big change she's also willing to take on big jobs big roles get involved it's opened her eyes to probably more opportunities than it would if she just stuck with the, with doing the same thing so I think Naomi is a really interesting example the second lady that I was going to talk about is Fran um, who again she joined us this year um, Fran was previously a university lecturer in neuroscience oh. I know and now she's got us that's a pretty really cool job thinking outside the box she really has made us think differently we have this um great event at demon uh which we call our demon days um and we have them twice a year and the endeavor of the demon days is to get everybody in the same room 
which is really great. Yes, it's really important that we just have that time. Invariably, we spend time talking and laughing and, and you know, have some presentations, but just generally it's all about connecting and coming back together. And in our last Demon Day back in June, um, she gave us a presentation, a fascinating presentation on what she called people, culture and the demon brain. And it was a huge open eye opener for all of us. It was absolutely incredible. It was so engaging. You could just look around the room and everybody was just like, wow, wow, wow. That's what my brain's doing now. That's what I'm thinking. It was absolutely brilliant. So she brings that to us. But then also as well, she's taken on the mantle. And I say it's a mantle of being our environmental champion. So, yes, she's working in the tech sector. Yes, she brings this interesting neuroscience university background. But she's also now um, in charge of achieving our net zero status. She's involved oh. in all of our pulling together our ESG um, reporting and our positioning and things like that. A really, really good example of two engineers, and I took both of them, that have chosen non-linear careers. And as a result, can bring so much more, even to an employer like Demon. It's just like, wow, these girls are coming in and they're absolutely setting the world on fire. And we're all just, you know, sitting back and saying, this is incredible. These guys, yeah. these girls, these guys, girls are absolutely brilliant. And having that confidence as well, I mean, the way you described both of them, they sound very, you know, happy to try new things and, and move ahead. Sometimes, you know, we kind of, we overthink things and think, oh, you know, it, here's a reason why I want to try something and here's 10 reasons why I shouldn't even attempt it. And Absolutely. sometimes just having the confidence to try new things, that really shows in um, employees that that are confident in in moving around and, and you know, just wanting to give new things a go. Um, and, and that's, you know, lo a lovely um, uh, staff member to have and a lovely part of the team as well to have that that feeling of driving everybody forward and, and really? feeling that we can try new things. Yeah. Um, we are almost out of time and I have one last question for you. Do okay. you have any advice for our listeners? Anyone that is kind of thinking, I'm thinking about taking a nonlinear career or have taken one and we're not quite sure what to do now? Sure. I, I thought about this, thought about this question long and hard and actually I found it relative. Well, having thought about it, I thought, yeah, no, that's what it is. And it's it, for me, it feels really simple. But but my advice would be always look for opportunities that interest you. Um, it's similar to what I was talking about before, regardless of the career or the industry you're in. If you're motivated by your job, your personal journey will continue to evolve. You will grow into these roles and you have so much more to offer your employer. I think that's that's what it's all about. If you're not interested or emotionally engaged in what you're doing and you've spent years there, how are you keeping yourself motivated? What I was saying to you before, are you waking up in the morning and thinking, yippee, I'm going to work? You're not. You're going to be thinking, yippee, I'm, oh dear, I'm going to work again. And, yeah. and that's really not right. And the employer's not getting the best out of you and you're not getting the best out of yourself and you're not developing as an individual. You're not growing, you're not evolving, you're not developing your skill set. So I think, you know, fundamentally, find the opportunity that interests you. The rest of it will all fall into place. You know, push the boundaries. Ultimately, you've got to enjoy what you've got to do and you shouldn't be curtailed by previous generations, previous ideas, preconceived ideas should all be about what motivates you and what makes you excited. And when you find that, brilliant. Yes, it is rare to find and it is rare to find um, being at the, the right employer that gets you. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions about being in tech and coming into the tech industry is that you have to have had a computer science degree Absolutely. to come in. It's yes. Just... <laughs> yes, I completely agree. That there is nobody less technical than myself. And I find myself in this position in a very much a technical industry. So <laughs> the world is everybody's oyster. If I can do it, anybody else can. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, that is lovely. Um, that is a lovely point to end it on. Thank you so much, Jane. It's been an absolute pleasure and it has flown by. So thank you so much for taking the time to, to join us today. Likewise. Thank you ever so much for having me. Thank you for everybody joining us as always. Thank you for listening and we hope to see you again next time. <laughs>